Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This is for UFC Vegas 90. I'm Paul Shaughnessy. Producer Megan is on the sticks. And man of little faith in Nate the Train, Cody Saftik, is on the line. I mean, I lost uh, I lost a shoey bet. I'll be, I'm about to be doing three shoeys here. So who am I to judge? But, you know, you, you, you disrespected your boy. You said... He's not, you know, he's not long enough. He's not fast enough. He's tough enough. That's just the, that's the Nate Landwehr game. Is just like, he's got that dog in him. I know people throw that around all the time, but it's really true with Nate the Train. What, what an animal. Yeah, well, he's Nate the Train, man. And yeah, 35 years old, at some point you got to think, especially 145, it's a speed division, but it doesn't matter because you're right. He's got the dog in him. So as soon as he felt the heat, he was like, okay, okay. Puts it back on Emmer's. Everyone can't handle the heat. Yeah, that's the way those kind of guys win. So it just sucks because he's my boy. You know, we're going to have to talk about Trevor Peak later on this card. Like you, you grow an attachment to these guys. You like their fight style. You like them as, you know, their personality. You like them as a, a human being. Sometimes you just got to make the decision. And it was the wrong decision on Nate Landwehr. So two shoeys. Uh, deservedly so. Deservedly so. Even if it was a one shoey bet, I would have done two just for that extra. I totally bitched out on that one, man. Chris Curtis also on this card. Like, I got a lot of boys. Once in a while, you got to go against them. But Nate the Train, that one is. So, good news is I got you on a three shoey bet on Chica Malcoon. But still, why are we doing this to each other, Paul? We're on the same side. And now here we're going to slam collectively five shoeys between us yeah. for no reason on a regular fight night card at the Apex. It'll make this a little um, bit more entertaining, I think, over the course of this show. Things are going to get sloppy, I feel like, by the end of... Uh, I mean, by by the time we get to Alexander Hernandez versus Damon Jackson, I feel like it's going to be a little sloppy in here. But yeah, I mean, Malcolm, like, sharpest hit bone in the game, bro. What a knockout. That was you know that, one, that one was such a weird one. I mean, it is what it is. You, you, you know, another term people throw around a lot is they're just like, oh, man, solid takedown defense. It, it, it's like shooting on a brick wall. You know, It's like shooting on a fire hydrant. That That is actually quite literally what happened. Like That's his fair. hips. And I remember like when I would wrestle back in the day, the coaches were big on like when the guy shoots, it's not so much just sprawl. It's like you're driving your hip purposely into them, stopping the momentum and sprawling. But it's like drive the hip, drive the hip. He shot a few takedowns, Petrovsky, never caught a whiff. Like he got his hands around Malkoon a couple times, peeled him to the ground. Right away, Malkoon's back up. I thought he was getting desperate. Perfectly honest. If he doesn't get knocked out on this super weird hip bone, like I thought writing was on the wall. He's getting outstruck by Jacob Malkoon. It's super strange. And he'd been rocked a few times in the first round with punches from he Jacob Malkoon. Tired. Malkoon shot one half-hearted takedown, didn't really commit to it, didn't get it. I thought that was weird because I figured that would be the game plan is tire this guy out, but clearly it wasn't even needed. And this is like not even not even a round and a half in, he knocks himself on a hip bone injury. Yeah, fair. I thought I was going to get the TKO regardless. I'll take it how I got it. Plus 425, I'll take it the way it was. But I felt like if it went to a second or third round, he was going to get it anyways. Doesn't matter, could have been a submission, who knows. So <laughs> I got you on a three, sh three shoey bet, you got me on a two. H how do you want to do this? Because... Someone's going to have to I talk while we're slamming drink. You did, eh? Okay, yeah. well, then you, you drive the, the video, pipe here like, for a bit. Megan, I'll, Megan, I'll Megan can verify I already did one. Um, and the video, the, the viewers will see that I slammed one back already. I'll slam number two right now. Well, it's probably easy for you because you got this little kid boot. Like, I don't even know that this is regulation. Like, who's who's officiating this thing? Because <sighs> I'm getting screwed. Buddy, you'll be able to use this in Vegas. Ooh. We're going on to Vegas next week. Which should be a good I guess that beer was shook. Which oh, should man. be a good time. But yeah, I'm gonna bring my uh, my spare booty for you. So you can uh, you can experience oh. the high life of drinking You're out of a child's pocket in boot. your bag? Yeah, I don't know, dude. I hope you get flagged at the airport. If you don't get flagged at the airport, <laughs> then they're not doing their jobs properly, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. We'll I see. mean Are you bringing two boots at least. The thing if about it is one it, boot? If they ask me yeah. about the thing about it is if they ask me about it, it'll be like I'm going to Vegas. I plan to drink out of it, and it's a hundred percent going to be true. And they'll be like, "Okay, story checks out." Like, there's no way it will be that weird. Who doesn't travel with their child size rain boots with rocket ships? And you're taking two, or you're taking one. 
Because when you do a shoe, you only need one shoe. So you pack in both of them? Well, well, I was so going to bring foamy. the other one for you. So you have something I'll just to be, I'll just be a man of. when I get to... Yeah, I know, I know. I got a really bad shoey here going. Okay, let's go. Oh, that's... No, it's just a <laughs> every, foam. You'll, every you'll, single... see, you'll see when it spills all over me. Okay, did those shoes go. used to be white or what? Oh, it's leaking through the sole, buddy. There's there's leakage on the bottom of that. You stepped on some nails with, with that or what? Not a boy. Not a boy. He's got a little Listen, little beer mustache. If Tai Tuivasa did a shoey, which he doesn't anymore because you'd have to win a fight in order for him to do that. Uh -huh. All jokes aside, yeah, yeah. Would you blame him? There was a little spillage. He's just like throwing back a half draft, man, and he's already sweaty, so it's nothing. He's going to go shower up in the back. Like, I get myself half covered in Pilsner, and then I got to go bring my daughter swimming at 345. So it's just like, it's not the best look, Paul. It's not the best look. But anyways, <laughs> I got I got one more to go. You got two more to go. Do you want to break down a fight and then slam him back, or what are you thinking? I mean, mine are already down the hatch at this point. That's when you're using... Three? You've done three? I've oh, done God. three. When you, do, when you use space-age technology like a child's rain boot, these things happen. Plus... I will say the seltzers that I got are like delicious. So all right, well I gotta stop being soft then. I'll slam the second one back. And let's it's a lot one. easier. Like I actively bought. I I'll, I'm gonna put everything out on the table here. I went out literally before recording to buy these specific seltzers because I was like I can slam those and I've got to do three of these quick time. Um, I have other seltzers at home that have a little bit more bite to them. I avoided those ones like the plague. Are you are you taking cheater sips there? No, man. Are you like taking cheater bonus. sips? No, no, no. I, I must have like as I was walking with these beers, shook up the case. Mm -hmm. The first one did the exact same thing. I was thinking this one might settle, so I was like, yeah, let's break down a fight or two, and then I'll have a drink. But Paul's like, yeah, man, I hit these things like little shots out of a kid's boot, and I'm done. <laughs> it's, like, oh, man. it's seltzers. He's drinking seltzers out of a kid's boot. I, I got to be the only one that finds something off with this. I've got to be. <sighs> okay. You're, you're the best at breaking down fights and, you know, you're the better gambler out of the two of us. I've got to be better at one thing and it's doing shoeies. Right. Fair. You know, I've got to I've got to bring something to the table here, Cody. I'm pretty good at like the production stuff as well, but nobody really seems to care about that. All right. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. This thing is spilling. Every all... single time, every oh. single time we cut to you, you have a different a different shoe that you're using. I would say stick to one shoe as your go to shoey boot. Oh, that's that's a leaker. You're you're, you're gonna have to hop in the shower before you take your kids anywhere. Because, I mean, if you get pulled over, my God, they're gonna be they're not gonna be too pleased about it there, bud. Yeah, don't drink and drive, but the limit's two drinks. I don't think you're allowed to have. I just happened to slam my two in a real quick succession. <clears throat> but whatever, that was a couple hours. Like, you know, you go to a pool, you're expected to shower before you get in the pool anyways. As if I'm going to show up on the pool all uh, smelling like beer. Also, Whoa. shout out to my wife because she's a tank, had a kid a couple days ago, and she's driving around, so maybe she'll just drive. That would probably be the smarter play, but we'll see We'll see how it goes, Paul. We'll see how it goes. We will see how it goes. Shall we get into the fights now, finally? I think we've been, like, we've been chatting around for at least 10 minutes at this point. Let's jump into the fights, my friend. Now, now that our debts have been paid, let's try to make some money. We got Brendan Allen taking on Chris Curtis in the main event of UFC Vegas 90. Brendan Allen, a minus 210 favorite. Chris Curtis can be had for plus 180. I mean, these guys already fought. And the last time that they fought, Chris Curtis got the knockout. We were on him. We were talking up. Chris Curtis, pretty big. It was early in Chris Curtis's career. Man's a brick wall. Pretty undersized for the, the division. I would say the thing that's di that differentiates this time around versus like the previous times that they fought is that Brendan Allen has made severe, severe improvements in his game. Obviously, when they fought the first time, he was like 23, 24 years old. He's really, really grown into his game at this point. 
Chris Curtis is the same guy. Chris Curtis probably should be a 170 pounder. He's always going to give up size against literally everybody. But I'm not going to lie, Cody. I still think that this is a bad matchup for Brendan Allen. Brendan Allen doesn't have the greatest wrestling. We know that Chris Curtis is an absolute brick wall. You put a gun to my head. I think it's dogger pass again. What about you? Yeah, I'm in the same boat. And I've been talking to a ton of people who are in on Chris Curtis. And yet the line really hasn't shifted all that much. So the, on one hand, yeah, Brendan Allen's made a lot more improvements because he's the younger fighter. And he learned a ton from that beating he took from Chris Curtis. He's gone on one hell of a run since the beating he took from Chris Curtis. So that's what young fighters do. Curtis, meanwhile, you could argue that there's been regression in all of his performance. Even his last time out against Marc-Andre Berrio in Toronto, just kind of a lackluster affair. He landed tons of strikes, but it just seemed like it was more of a sparring match. And that's the issue with Chris Curtis. He has high ring IQ. He makes good choices. But at times, he's just very selective with his punches, waiting on a counter, waiting on an opening, ripping to the body, you know, very, very selective with some of his shots. So I, I, there's been a rap at certain times that he's not that entertaining. And then there's the other times where he's the action man. It just depends on who the opponent is. And in Brandon Allen's case, he's still high, hyper aggressive, comes forward and tries to make it a fight. So He's going to cause Chris Curtis to give the best that he's got. And I do feel like even at 36 years old with a 40 fight veteran or 40 fight uh, resume under his belt that Chris Curtis has enough to offer. Looking at Allen since the knockout loss to him, he beats his old buddy, uh, Sam Alvey. Okay. Long in the tooth. Now doing karate combat. Apparently Jacob Malkoon, strong, strong argument that he did not win that fight. I had bet him that night, and I'm glad they gave him the nod. But, I mean, he got taken down seven times. He got largely controlled. Malkoon is one-dimensional grappler, okay? Jocko, Jocko's, like, not a top 15 guy. Like, fringe 15, fringe 20. Not the highest quality of win, but, a, but a, still a quality victory. But Andre Muniz, one-dimensional grappler. Bruno Silva, apparently not good at all. And Paul Craig, a one-dimensional grappler. So really, he hasn't fought anybody like Chris Curtis since. He hasn't fought anybody who's a sprawl and brawl type guy. Solid boxing, works the body, works the legs, doesn't discriminate, you know, where he's mixing up his shots. Rolls with everything, five-round cardio, stuff your takedowns and box you up. Like, that's Chris Curtis's game. And to be honest, even though he's been on this solid win streak since, it's largely been against grapplers. When you look at Curtis, meanwhile, it's not like he's been having tons of success. But again, Kelvin Gastelum fight, he gets headbutted, goes down. Uh, that, 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 that's a tough go. Otherwise, I think he wins the fight. Watch it back. Otherwise, he, he beats Kelvin Gastelum. Just the headbutt in the second round really did cost him. Nasruddin Imovov fight, I, I thought he looked flat. Headbutt ends that one as well. <clears throat> Marc-Andre Barrio. Again, it was kind of like a close-ish fight. I thought he won. The judges got it right. But split decision, fair enough, because it kind of was a close-ish fight. So... So all the points that people make about Brandon Allen, that he's been looking awesome since, I agree. Chris Curtis kind of been looking middling, hasn't, you know, maybe been just looking at the same level. He's looked as good since, maybe looked good in the Buckley fight, obviously. But since that initial run where he's just knocking out Phil Haas, Joachim Buckley, and, uh, and Brandon Allen, like outside of that run, yeah, mid results. So, so eventually, Brandon Allen maybe is able to beat Chris Curtis. But on Saturday night, I think I think Action Man does it again. The last points being is that the last time they fought, Action Man was actually on short notice. Took the fight on short notice because he used to be a training partner of Brandon Allen. Sparred Brandon Allen a bunch of times in the gym, was grappled Brandon Allen, and was highly confident going into that short notice time the first time around. I beat this guy. Goes out, works him over, knocks him out, and now they're booking him again on short notice. I don't think it affects him. He's in the gym six days a week, twice a day, consummate pro. Look at the shape that Chris Curtis is in phenomenal guy's got amazing genetics i think he's ready to go and i think it's much of the same uh, the the one thing is if it was a three-round fight i think brendan allen's long and he's fast and he's youthful and maybe he doesn't get tko'd in the second round maybe he's able to you know win a couple rounds and then grease this thing out on a on a, on a scorecard but on a five-round fight he's gonna eventually face the heat of curtis's punching power and at that point i think he topples over again so Chris Curtis likely by TKO, but why get greedy? Just take the plus money money line. Let's go. Let's go. Underdog in the first fight of UFC Vegas 90. We've got Alexander Hernandez taking on Damon Jackson in the co-main. Minus 210 for Alexander the Great. Hernandez and Damon Jackson can be had for plus 180. Who you got? 
this one screams apple pie shitter, but for the, whatever reason, I still just can't pull the trigger on it. So I am going with Alexander Hernandez. And again, why are you going with Hernandez? Because he just seems maybe not the better fighter, but just the better athlete. He's faster. He's stronger. He's got better wrestling. His jiu-jitsu, I wouldn't say is better than Damon Jackson's, but if he's getting the takedowns and he's on top and he's ground and pounding him, then it's just as good, if not better than Damon Jackson's. Trains at Altitude, you know, over in Colorado at Factory X. Literally one of the coaches at Factory X. And you see what they're doing with guys like Yusuf Zalal just recently came back to the UFC. Or Brandon Royval recently just retired Brandon Moreno. It's a solid gym and these guys got cardio for days. Like, what he brings to the table is solid. And if you were to break down every aspect of his game, right? Like, well, what's his power like? Dude knocked out Benil Dariush in less than a minute with a forearm. What's his explosiveness like? Goes zero to a 60 like nothing. Wrestling, solid. Cardio, not bad, but again, he's at altitude. Like, could, could be a little bit better. When you're that explosive, your cardio is never going to be, you know, rock solid, unless you're an elite fighter, which obviously Hernandez isn't. It's just he's hit and miss with his confidence level. Like, you remember when he was on that solid streak? He thought he was the man. He talks all that shit to Donald Cerrone at the press conference, and it was like he believed it. But unfortunately, his skills weren't quite there. And Cerrone put an absolute classic beating on him. Since then, it's just been a mixed bag of results. If he fights lower-end guys, he thinks he can beat them. He shows out a little bit. If he's fighting these higher-end guys, it's like he doubts himself. And even though he's got all the skills on paper, and on again, on paper, super well-rounded, you know, youthful guy, still only 30 years old, what's there not to like about Alexander Hernandez? it's just how confident is he? And then you go back to just two fights ago, he goes and he fights at Jim Miller. That win aged pretty well, man. Beating Jim Miller still does mean something. And it's a solid victory for him. He lands 108 significant strikes over Jim Miller. Had output, had cardio, solid victory. And then his last time out against Bill Aljeo, it's him getting out volume again. Him starting to worry. Him starting to huff and puff. And his cardio starting to let up. So... When he's minus 210, you don't love it. You're never going to love it. You're never going to love it because he's more of a minus 110 kind of guy, minus 135 kind of guy over a lot of the guys in the division because you don't know which version of him is going to show up. Damon Jackson, meanwhile, he's a little bit older, and I don't think he's got great durability. Like, I think one of the path of victories for Hernandez is just put the heat on this guy and break him early. But again, he's a BJJ black belt. He's a 35 veteran. He's fought high level of competition and uh, when he's on he's a fighter he's got that scrap in him we often talk about these guys like nate landwehr trevor peak or chris curtis that got that dog in them at times they'll come forward they'll mix it up and they've got that durability there's other guys that are absolute dogs like julian arosa just doesn't have the durability wants to be a dog doesn't necessarily have the durability damon jackson's that guy him at his best, he is the leech. He'll suck the energy right out of you. Striking, a little robotic, a little stiff, keeps his head up straight, usually just moves on a straight path, but he puts heat on guys. He pressures guys, and he breaks them down. It's that he leaves himself vulnerable to get counterpunched. And Hernandez, not a great counterpuncher for the record, but has enough power that at some point, I think he just hits him. If he doesn't hit him and he doesn't hurt him, he's got the path that he could just muscle the takedowns, lie up on guard, and you're going to have to work from guard. You can't just lie there. Like, Damon Jackson's going to be throwing up elbows. He's going to be throwing up submission attempts. He's going to be working. But you can at least neutralize him, spend some top control, ground and pound him a little bit, and hopefully secure a couple rounds, right? So I, I think Hernandez wins more often than not. The money line, you know, suggestive of the exact same thing. It's that when you're looking at some of these minus 200 favorites that are going to shit in your parlays, Hernandez probably be one of those guys because he's done it before. So buyer beware. Of. Yeah, no, I kind of see... A lot of the same thing as you. Like, Alexander Hernandez is not a guy I want to be betting at chalk. Literally against too many guys in the featherweight division in the UFC. We've just seen time and time again. It's like his mo, like he can go the full three rounds, but he falls off of a cliff usually after the first seven and a half minutes. Um, you're never going to see his best round be the third round. I see a lot of paths to victory where he absolutely just disposes of Damon Jackson in the first round. You know, you look at these two guys next to If you saw these two guys in the bar, Cody, you know, we know who you would be picking to win the fight. If they had their shirts off in the bar, you'd be like, oh, that super, super jacked guy, kid over there, he's going to absolutely just train wreck, you know, the balding, like, you know, uh, computer engineer or whatever. Yeah, Damon Jackson kind of has that look to him. But if this fight gets extended into the later second round, third round, 
I don't know. There's this potential that like Damon Jackson, crafty veteran, could find his knack, could end up in a scramble, and and who knows what happens from there. Um, I'll say more often not than not as well that Alexander Hernandez gets the job done and takes him out in the first seven and a half minutes of this fight, but it's it's a dodgy proposition at the best of times, especially yeah with Hernandez as Chuck, you're never gonna feel great about him. Moving on down, we've got Morgan Sherrier taking on Chepe Mariscal. Morgan Sherrier is a minus 115 favorite. Chepe can be had for plus or minus 105. This one was like a considerably water. It was like minus 160 or so. Um, literally a couple days ago. People are liking themselves some Chepe, Cody. Do you? Yeah, yeah, I'm like a Chepe. I got some plus money uh, plays on him already. And I, I think if you're going to give me plus money, he's the play. Is it going to be a close fight? Is it going to be a competitive fight? Very likely. But if you're going to give me plus money on Chepe Mariscal, I think he's got just the volume. The volume really does it for me. So the thing with Morgan Sherrier, if you're not familiar with him, is that all of his fights prior to signing with the UFC are just, they're always close. He don't throw she. He doesn't. He doesn't. He largely just stands, waits, looks to counter, lands 30 significant strikes. His opponents don't necessarily land a ton either because he's being so defensive, but they're not great fights, and they're largely going to decision. And even though he's only 28 years old, he's got 30 fights under his record, 10 of which are losses. They'll tell you he's got 9 losses in a draw. He's got 10 losses in a draw. So losing is something he's comfortable with because he just goes through the motions, goes through the motions. Prior to his UFC debut, we'll get to that. You look at him, I've never seen this before. I, I honestly don't think I've ever seen this before. But again, a lot of decisions. Loses this fight by split. We'll just count them. He's got one split, one majority loss. There's a split draw, then a majority draw, uh, majority loss. <clears throat> a split, so that's three splits and two majorities. Then a split to Jordan, that's four. And then a majority loss to Paul Hughes. So he's, he's collectively had four majority decisions and three split decisions. Sorry. Uh, four splits and three majorities over the course of like 20 of his fights. The loss is Paul Hughes. You know, Jordan Vukovic, he, he's actually not bad. He just won the cage warrior title last, last Friday. Saw him back, you know, you know, couldn't really cut it in Bellator for the record. Got a win over Patty Pimblett, but did that really even mean anything? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What I'm saying is he's kind of mixed it up with like the better guys on the European to a middle level of guys on the European regional scene with mixed results. Largely in these split decision, majority decision, one judge thinks he won, two thinks he lost, two thinks he won, one thinks he lost, one guy has it a draw because nothing happened, and he's super low output. Just don't like it. Don't like it. Don't like the style. So he's from France. UFC goes to France. They need some French fighters. You know, he's still only 28. He's got a pretty long in the tooth record, truth be told, for, for where he's at in his career. So they sign him, and they give him just the worst guy, man, the worst guy. Oh, he takes this Manolo Zucchini guy. And uh, for I'll, I'll be honest, like he actually showed up. He, he was in front of a hometown crowd. He actually threw a ton of volume, beat him up, knocked him down. Body kicks were nasty. Guy is athletic. He's got skill. He's got legitimate skill. It's that prior to coming to that one fight against a punching bag. And the average person could probably, if you hit a timer and you're like, bam, five minutes, how many times can you hit this punching bag? probably hit it three, 400 times, right? 500 times, you know, one punch per second. That's basically what it was. He's fighting a punching bag and then he just teed off on him. So I don't, I don't know, or at least I'm not fully convinced that this guy's suddenly a volume guy. I think he could go right back to what he normally does, which is pick and choose and fight low volume and not land a ton of damage. Not the biggest power guy, not the biggest submission threat. And then if you're going to say that he's the favorite, I know it's going to be a close fight, likely a decision. I would just automatically take that that plus money B side. That plus money B side happens to be Chepe Mariscal, who's pretty much the polar opposite. Like he's hell on wheels. He's coming after you. He's aggressive. He's looking to mix it up. He's got a judo black belt, so he throws some takedowns in the mix. And one thing that's super interesting about Chepe, when I talk about this guy's just, you know, a run and gun type guy, is fight with Trevor Peak. So you look at it, he only landed 71 significant strikes against Trevor Peak. It's really not all that good, but, but that's significant strikes. When you look at his total strikes, he lands... 145 total strikes. Peak landed 65 total strikes. 51 were significant. Chepe had 71. The main thing is, is that it's a blowaway number when you look at he landed 145 total. 
Now, what you think and what a judge thinks and what someone at home thinks is significant is really regardless. It's the work. He's just continuously working. For a guy like Morgan Sherrier, who's not really heavy on the work department, it's not, it doesn't bode all that well, right? Then his very next fight with Jack Jenkins, you'll say, oh, geez, he knocked out Jack Jenkins. And again, if you're just a stats guy, he got outstruck by Jack Jenkins, 41 to 38, but really not the case. See, he, he outlanded Jack Jenkins, 87 to 43 in the total strikes department. So again, it's like he's just, there's a constant work rate out of him. He's mixing in takedowns. He's ground and pounding you. He's letting you back up. He, he, he's going back on the attack. Trains at altitude. Trains in, in Denver, 5,000 feet above sea level. Has rock solid cardio. Took all of Trevor Peak's best punches and smiled at him. Has rock solid durability. It is just constantly working. So the fact that I think he's got a better takedown game than Morgan Sherrier, I think he's got adequate enough grappling, probably a better gas tank, better durability, if not as good of durability, and is just constantly working in a small little venue like the Apex. That's what the judges and that's what the few people there are looking for is damage and work rate. In a giant arena in Paris, France, where there's hometown crowds are just cheering you and you're feeling good and you're beating on some tomato can brought in from Italy. <laughs> You know, you, one guy's in for a different experience. Chepe, meanwhile, should thrive within that small, intimate setting that is the UFC Apex. So, yeah, again, if you, they were giving out plus money on Chepe, it just seems fair. Last thing on Chepe is, like, it, I always say, Morgan was fighting against mid-level to higher-ish level European regional scene guys. European regional scene guys. None of which, for the most part, made it beyond the European regional scene. Chepe Mariscal, this is prior to him signing to the UFC. Okay? He never signed with the UFC. He fought Gregor Gillespie. He went the distance with Bryce Mitchell. He fought Pat Sabatini and beat him by split decision. He won against Yusuf Zalal by unanimous decision. First guy to beat Yusuf Zalal took his O. He fought Joe Anderson, Brito, Steve Garcia, and Sean Soriano. All UFC veterans. Before he ever even signed with the UFC. He's battle-tested. He's ready to go. He earned his spot on the roster. He didn't just get signed because they were in his backyard and they needed local guys. And so as much as Morgan Sherrier is talented, and I can't take that away from him, it's like it's totally live dog money on Chepe. I don't see how you could not see that. Training in camp right now with Trevor Peak. He's with Corey Sanhagen. He's with Justin Gaethje, who's fighting for the BMFL title next weekend. Got a training guy partner on the card. Dwayne Ludwig's lead in the camp right now. Like, what more could you want at plus money? So, yeah, yeah, I signed up. And it seems like the trend is... He's a popular dog pick now, so yeah, people are people are putting some money on him. Can't fault them. Yeah, no, it's like it's he's gonna flip to the favorite, it seems like, and I can't really disagree with with that. Like you kind of spelled out all of the case for it. There seems to be plenty of paths outside of like, you know, flash knockout, but you know, when you play punchy kicky, these things happen. That's definitely a Morgan Sherrier outside of his UFC debut has not like proven to be some sort of like murderous power puncher. He's always been like low volume, uh, more of like a point fighter type of style. Chepe has got to go in there. He's got to like do his best Nate Landwehr impression. Make this a dog fight. Made mm. some big shots early, but um, wear this guy down and make it an absolute scrap. So, yeah, I agree with the line movement. I agree with you. On all of the takes there, I, I wish I got some of the Chepe earlier, you know, the plus 140s and all of that, but I did not. So uh, he'll be the pick for me. I'm sure I'll find some way to get involved in this fight in some way, shape, or form. Probably take some of the money line at a worse number, but uh, there's a few fights on this card that like I was like looking at the odds, didn't snap, and then the odds have kind of won against me. So I should have acted a little bit earlier, but is what it is, as they say. Moving on down, we've got Ignacio Bahamandes taking on Christos Giagos. Minus 320 for Bahamandes, plus 270 for Giagos. Who you got here? Yeah, so the Giagos, I, I really like him in terms of I'm a fight fan. At the, at the end of the day, you know, you're a gambler and you're an analyst and you're this and that and blah, blah, blah. But, like, you're a fight fan. This is what you love. Giagos' fights, always good. Always good. He either finds a way to steamroll you in that opening three minutes, maybe five minutes at most, or he just falls right off a cliff after seven and a half minutes and is done. Regardless, it's always entertaining. But yeah, at 34 years old, a guy that's just predicated on explosiveness, athleticism, just ragdolling opponents in that early going, it's like hey, he's starting to lose a little bit. His durability was never great. His cardio sure as shite has never been great. Remember the Carlton Minus fight? Gassed in the third round. 
they have lost the third round, or at least certainly did not do good in the third round again. Carlton minus 10 8 them in the first and second. Still find a what still finds ways to almost lose late. So he's like a poor man's Michael Chandler. Like he he's got a big explosive overhand, right? He can wrestle, he's got solid BJJ, but unlike Michael Chandler, who's a world champion, Chandler keeps on going and Giagos just kind of falls off. So always gonna be dangerous, but yeah, keep 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 in mind that. Ignacio Bahamandes, meanwhile, you know, I marvel at this guy as a ultra prospect. I think he's the real deal. He's six foot three, no idea how he makes 155 pounds. No idea. But at the weight class, he is absolutely giant. He's got cast iron chin. He's got solid, you know, submission defense. I guess he hasn't really been tested a, a whole lot in the submission department. But still, solid submission defense, solid chin, solid durability, really good cardio, puts a pace on guys. And with that length, those knees up the middle are just so effortless for him. The spinning hook kick, the spinning kicks, like any of that stuff, he's not reaching up for your head. He just has to, like, throw it to your body. He's so much taller than you. It just happens to blast you in the face like Ignacio Bahamondes, but like any green prospect, especially a South American green, not, not from Brazil, South America, but outside of that, is that his grappling just really quite isn't there yet. And beyond that, because he's so tall, he spends a lot of time chasing his opponents down. His footwork's not great, and he's not the fastest guy going. So if you're a high ring IQ, single shot, pot shot, point style fighter, like Morgan Cherrier, you'll do really good against it. And those are his losses. When you look at both of his losses, John McDessie and Ludovic Klein, both guys are very fleet-footed, quick, and they don't throw combinations. They don't necessarily look for the kill shot. McDessie's a savvy veteran. Ludovic Klein, he's on a hell of a roll. Like, the, the guy's, I wouldn't say the real deal. I really don't think he is, but solid enough top 15 guy. You're going to lose certain fights like that. You're going to have to learn. You're going to have to make adjustments. And against these guys that are not really engaging you, but just shooting and then taking off, he's got to chase them around for three rounds. Sometimes he'll lose a few of these rounds. In both instances, he takes a lot of shots to the head, and it doesn't deter him. He, he continuously marches you down. It's just quick guys in and out. That's going to be a problem to him. Power wrestlers, maybe like Giagos, that can dump him over and over over the course of 15 minutes could be a problem. But Giangos, who can only do it for six or seven minutes, it's not going to work. There might be an initial takedown. There might be, like, an initial two takedowns. But Bahamandes has got solid hips. For a tall guy, he's got tall man takedown defense. But he's got a ton of leverage, so it's not the easiest thing to do to take him down. So Giangos will likely muscle him down, which he was probably going to do anyways. But he'll exert himself a little bit extra. I see probably a couple takedowns in the first round. And then Bahamandes either gets up, chin checks him, hits him with the knee on the entry and puts him away. Or... The round ends, and if the round ends and you can get a better line on Baja Mondes, maybe even plus money if he got beat in that first round, got taken down, controlled, I'm in on the live market on Baja Mondes if he loses the first. Because the second and the third round is the key here. That's where Giagos will be tired. The threat of the takedown won't be there. His boxing is just not quite good enough to, to stay defensive, and he's not a retreat-type fighter. So Baja Mondes wins this fight. How do you play it? You play it right now on a parlay. Like He's going to be a parlay piece. I think he played in the live market if for whatever Giagos is competitive in that opening round, which wouldn't be crazy. That would be the time to maybe hit it live. Or you just hit that Bahamanas by TKO. Maybe that under two and a half. I don't like the under one and a half just because things mm -hmm. could get greasy right around the seven minute mark and then you're really sweating it. But it probably doesn't go a whole lot over the over one and a half. So I think he's one of the picks this week. What do I know? I just, he looks like he's one of the guys that should get the victory. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. Giagos is coming up. Like, it was UFC Noche. It was uh, Chris Giagos versus Daniel Zellhuber. And everything that you kind of described of like how Baja Mondes is going to win this fight is literally how it played out in that fight. You know, Giagos comes out. Anybody who would bet uh, Giagos is feeling real good about it in round one. You know, doubles him up oh, in yeah. significant strikes. It was like 26 to 12. And then, the, you know, you see the cardio, the wheels start to fall off. And then he's eating shots at range, doesn't have much defense, isn't exactly trying to wrestle whatsoever. Because he knows that it's like, if I even try to wrestle right now, I'm just going to deplete my gas tank even more. You know, he landed some big shots. It's always going to be a risk in this game. But, you know, you go hope through Bahamandes' career, and it's just like, he doesn't really... Early in his career, he was losing by submission, but he hasn't been knocked out um, by anybody. He's taken on some half-decent guys, uh, some guys with some decent power. 
it's obviously in play that it's possible Giagos could land the perfect bomb early, but I'm with you. I think the longer that this fight plays out, Bahamondes will take control. And frankly, with his length and his reach, he may make it really hard for uh, Christos Giago, Stephen Land, early in the in the fight as well. So you may not get that er, uh, that great entry on Bahamondes. You know, but if Bahamondes is just like maintaining range, controlling, doing really well, you're, you're not going to get better than the plus minus three twenty. But yeah, it's more of a fight that I'm hoping, hoping that like Giago's does well, so I can back. Bahamandes in round two um, or at the end of round one or at some point in round two when I see Giagos as Giagos does time and time again you know it just falls off of a cliff we've seen the story over and over and over so don't hop off the ship now um, we got Walter Walker taking on Lukas Breschke minus 260 for Walker plus 220 for Breschke who he got because this one's super weird. So, like, I'd love to see the birth certificate, but Walter Walker is Johnny Walker's brother. And there's just no way. No, this is probably going to sound disrespectful. Just no way they're full brothers, right? It's either got to be, like, his mom's got a bunch of kids or his dad's got a bunch of kids. But, like, outside of both being, like, six foot six and being fairly athletic for the, these big guys, Walker, Johnny's very athletic. Walter's fairly athletic. Um... Yeah, I don't know, man. That's where it ends. Like, one guy lives in trains in Ireland. One guy lives in trains in Russia. Uh, they look absolutely nothing alike. Nothing alike. Nothing. But I suppose it is possible. Now, like a lot of brother duos we've been talking about, it's like, ah, one's good. One's not so much good. In Volker, Walter Volker's case, he looked like he could absolutely be a fraud or he could be a legitimate heavyweight prospect. Like, again, he's only 26 years old. So by heavyweight standards, this guy's nowhere near his prime. Got an 11-0 record, and it's a little bit salty. Like, some of the guys he's fought haven't exactly been the highest level of competition. But again, he's athletic for a big man. He's able to just, you know, more so muscle guys to the ground. But he can he can finesse once in a while, get his opponents to the ground, and then just ride them. Like he's 265 pounds. He's a big boy. He's a big, solid six foot six two sixty five. 265, every bit of it. And yet, he moves pretty good. So, there's something that you could work with 100%. And training in Russia, well, that's certainly not going to help or, or hurt. Sorry. This fight with Alex Nicholson, uh, his last time out, if you're some uber prospect, then you probably shouldn't be going to the fourth round with Alex Nicholson. That's fair. At the same time, Alex Nicholson's a UFC veteran, half foot savvy guy, got tons of experience under his belt, trains at a fairly good gym over in South Florida. So it's not like it's not a quality victory. But to me, the fact that you can watch but fight back it's a fourth round finish. You know what I mean? Like he's not stopping. He looks like he's got decent cardio. And then, and then he's not, I wouldn't say he's the ultimate package heavyweight prospect. It's just that he's got all the building blocks for things that you like. He's massive. Six, six, two sixty five. He's very athletic. His cardio is really not that bad. And even though he can strike and he can explode with these big maneuvers, his ground game is really not all that bad. And he's been taking guys down, which is the path that I would like. Because a lot of these heavyweights, they can't wrestle for shit. So if you just take them down, you can hold them down for just long stretches. and It's a, it's a path to victory at heavyweight. Always has been. Who, when you look at every other division in the sport, it's like, who are the good grapplers? This guy's a tremendous grappler. This guy, tremendous grappler. Every division has elite grapplers. Light heavyweight, not a ton of them. Heavyweight, there's just none. And that's why guys like Frank Mir, super me mediocre. Very, very mediocre. But like, has Williams. a decent ground game. Tons of guys. Yeah, it's, 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 nobody <laughs> else can wrestle and nobody else can grapple. Then, like, even if you're striking is crap and your card is really not that good, you're not very, very athletic. Doesn't matter. If you can just grapple, you'll go far. And if you put me on the spot and we're like, who are the three best grapplers in the heavyweight division? If you consider Jones a heavyweight, then John Jones is instantly one of them. But who are the other guys? Sergey Pavlovich. They say he can grapple. Just I've never seen it yet. And like every. You know, everybody else is a striker. Everybody else is a striker. That's what heavyweights do. So in this instance, I'm intrigued with Walter Walker and what he pr potentially presents to the rest of the division. Lucas Berzewski, it's not anything against him. It's that he usually clocks in at about 236. So he's not a big heavyweight to begin with. He's a guy that, you know, I wouldn't say could make 205, but he's caught in this in-between where he's not a big heavyweight, but he's just too big for the light heavyweight division. Himself clocking in at six foot four with a seventy eight reach, a seventy eight inch reach. You know, big guy. Falker's got like an eighty one inch reach for the record, freak of nature. 
When you look at Brzezinski, I'm willing to give him a pass on the Waldo Cortez Acosta fight. You know, good fighter. Knocked down the first round, problematic, because Cortez Acosta is not a power puncher. He's gone to decision with, like, a ton of guys that were suspect or ability. Not the biggest power puncher, and yet he just murders Brzezinski in the first round. The fight with Martin Budai, people said that he might have won that fight. He landed 116 significant strikes in that fight and didn't tire out. That's not the one that's concerning to me. It's the Carl Williams fight. You brought up Carl Williams. It's the Carl Williams fight. Mm -hmm. Carl Williams, you know, way faster, way more explosive, lands the knockdown. It was his ability to just take him down at will. And beyond that, when he would take him down, it causes Brzezinski to have to carry his weight. And Brzezinski just absolutely gassed carrying the weight. He didn't gas against Martin Buda when he was able to strike and lean up against the fence and stay upright. But as far as it was, I'm on my back, I need to find a way up. He did not have it. He did not have it. Subsequent fight right after that, he gets knocked out standing in three minutes. Don't care about that one. It was the one before. So Walter Walker, as much as there's question marks, and again, he could be fraudulent. Don't get me wrong. I think there's an easy path to victory here for him where you're 40 pounds heavier than this man. Take him down, which you can, and then as soon as you do, cause him to carry your weight. Once he does, he's going to tire out. The takedowns become easier. The ground and pound becomes easier. Winning on a points decision, fair. If not, take him out. But the fact that you just went four rounds with Alex Nicholson and were able to continuously apply pressure, Alex Nicholson probably not. Yeah, yeah, he's not as good as Lucas Brzezinski. But it's not marginal, Paul. It's not no. marginal. I mean, it's a similar path to victory. Just do exactly what you just did. Use the cardio. Use the takedown. Grind this man away. Put him away. So I do have Walter Walker. But when we talk about middling heavyweights and betting them at... You know, you know, a certain price tag. This guy's on his UFC debut. There's a ton of question marks. You don't feel safe about it, but he is the pick, 100. percent And there will be a play. On. Yeah, well, he's he's going to be in the PRP. Um, he was like a minus 400 favorite like a few days ago, and people have come in on Lucas Prochesky. I mean, I guess going to the fourth round with Alex Nicholson, considering what Alex Nicholson did in the UFC. And when Alex Nicholson was in the UFC, he wasn't actually a heavyweight. Um, I can understand why there's like you know some red flags there, but all you you had me at Walter Walker is able to grapple, and then I look up and go doo -doo 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 -doo. look at it. Carl Williams eight takedowns against Brzezinski. Just stick to that game plan. Get these takedowns. Use your size. Use your what you have as an advantage in this fight against Prochesky, like, who knows if Walter Walker is going to be anything down the line. But this matchup is, if your main game plan is wrestling, takedowns, top control, uh, and, and positional awareness, this is the matchup for you to get your first UFC win. So I'll go against where the market has been moving, and I'll pick Walter Walker with you. We got Charlie Campbell taking on your boy, Trevor Peak. It's Trevor Peak fight week, Cody. Who you got? Gotta go Trevor Peak. Yeah. I mean, I betrayed Nate Landwehr, so uh at least I could redeem myself a little bit. I honestly think Trevor Peak can't win this fight. Is it gonna be hard? Absolutely. It on paper is Charlie Campbell, you know, the more skilled fighter. Yeah, maybe if you're looking at it on paper, but Trevor Peak's another one of these guys that's got that dog in him, and he may be taking a beating early, but he's shown an ability to take one hell of a punch, overcome a lot of bad spots, and put heat on his opponents. Charlie Campbell is super talented. He's got a long range. He's got, I think, a three-inch reach advantage on, on Trevor Peak. He's much taller, six foot coming in against like 5'9". Uh, there's a lot that you would like against Charlie Campbell. He's faster. He's got a nasty jab, and a jab is going to work extremely well against someone like Trevor Peak, who tends to throw everything a little bit more loopy. So why not jump on the Charlie Campbell train? It's Again, it comes down to one guy's got that dog, take one hell of a punch, and when Charlie Campbell is a finesse fighter, but I'm not sold on his ability to dig his punch. You look at his loss to Chris Duncan on the Contender Series. He is lighting up Chris Duncan, who, by the way, is a solid fighter in his own right. But he's just having his way with him. It's Duncan's ability to just survive, take a couple initial shots, and then return fire. Now, keep in mind, Charlie Campbell, the exact stats on that one. Uh, Charlie Campbell had landed... 16 significant strikes, I suppose. But the finishing sequence, if you want to go back and watch it, it's like everything's landing. It's like boom, knee, boom, right hand, boom. And it's, oh man, Duncan just ate it flush. Oh man, Duncan just ate it flush. Oh man, Duncan just ate it flush. And the literally the one time Duncan returns fire and lands in the sequence, Charlie Campbell's out before he hits the ground. So 
There's been other spots in his career where it's like he tends to fight with his head just a tad bit high. Even though he is a much longer fighter, he does not fight like a longer fighter. He's aggressive. He's coming forward. And he's neutralizing his own reach advantage by trying to fight his opponent in the pocket because he wants to entertain and he wants to win a $50,000 bonus in the UFC and he wants to put it on. Like, I, I get it. It's an entertainment sport. You're going to make a ton of fans that way. And there's a ton of Charlie Campbell fans. Rightfully so. Guy's a badass. But in the Trevor Peak fight, it's like you might be putting hands on him. At some point, he's returning fire. You've seen it time and time again. The Malik Lewis fight on the Contender Series, much of the same. He is getting beat pillar to post. Some refs might have considered stopping that fight, but they don't. They let Trevor fight through it. And as soon as you're done unloading on him and it's his turn, not a whole lot of guys are going to stand up to it. Chepe Mariscal did stand up to it, which is part of the reason why I think that guy's a badass. And then to Trevor Peak's credit, Peak starts fighting as an amateur in like 2013, right? And he's 18 years old. 18 years old. Yeah, 2013, he's an 18 year old kid. By the time he turned pro, his pro debut, he's a 25 year old, okay? He spent seven years from his amateur debut to the time he made his pro debut because he was getting in trouble with the law. He was half training. He's training himself in his own garage. He's not getting proper mitt work. He's not, doesn't have proper training partners. As soon as he moved over to Ogogi, one of the top camps in Tennessee, you see his game take over. It's just like anything, eventually you're going to get tapped out. And Trevor Peak's on a four-fight UFC deal. The first three fights have now passed. He's 2-1 and one in that span, but he's coming off not the greatest performance, his first decision in, shit, a really long time, and just not exactly the most entertaining of fights, and then prior to that, loses the Chepe Mariscal fight. So, sorry, he's not 2-1 in the UFC. He's 1-2 in the UFC, and now he's on the last fight of a four-fight deal. So he's got to put himself in the best position to succeed. And so he leaves the confines of home where he's got his friends and family and a huge support system, all of his sponsors. He leaves that and he puts himself in a bad spot and goes over to Colorado where one, altitude's not going to hurt a guy like this who's very much predicated on pace and pressure. And you, you need a full tank of gas if you're going to be able to fight that style. So going to Colorado, that's going to be a big help. But going to Colorado to train with Justin Gaethje, who's fighting next month for the BMF title or next week for the BMF title, is conceivably in great shape. He's out there with Chepe Mariscal, the guy that beat him, the guy that's on this card. It's, it, he's, he's doing all of the right things. I love it. And again, I, I know I keep flipping here. He's not 1-2 in the UFC. He's 2-1 in the UFC. He's got the win over Yaya, and he's got the win over Eric Gonzalez. One loss to Chepe. But still, you want to win out in impressive fashion and cap it off and sign a new deal. And that's what he's looking to do. He put himself in a good spot for eight weeks with some of the best guys in the game at altitude, and all that's going to give him is just more of a puncher's chance. We knew he had a puncher's chance before. He's throwing hammer fists. He's throwing wild, clobbering left hooks. We know he's got all that. Him going over there to train with the man that beat his ass, to train with one of the best guys in the game, to train with Corey Sanhagen, to train with under Dwayne Ludwig, again, that's just going to add to the fact that what we knew he was going to bring before, he should be able to bring for 15 full minutes. And it only takes one to absolutely knock Charlie Campbell out. We know that. So, again, if this is 50-50, or Trevor Peak is the favorite, you might be reconsidering it. But at plus money, this is a dog pass all day. And Trevor Peak is that dog. You know he's got it in him. I like it. I like it. Now, again, his win condition is probably KO. So if you want to get it better than the money line, you probably take it by KO. Yeah, he won a decision his last time out. Way different matchup. Way different matchup. Different camp. Different style. I think you see vintage peak performance here. And think about it this way. Trevor Peak, you know, the the decision fight against Mohamed Yaya. That was in Abu Dhabi. Chepe, that one was in Jacksonville, Florida. And then what do we have here? Eric Gonzalez, KO1. It's in the apex, baby. Apex is the Trevor Peak hunting grounds. Small He's cage, the apex. small cage, all the violence. I mean, that's 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 where he shines. And like going through Campbell's record, it's just like doesn't really seem like much of their of a of a grappler by any stretch of the imagination. Duncan has made a lot of improvements, but like when Duncan knocked this guy out, I would say Duncan was not where he is now after all that time that he spent down in Florida training with ATT. Um, yeah, Trevor Peak, Trevor Peak knockout, Trevor Peak knockout one. Um, let's get it.
Trevor Peak Fight Week, baby. Let's go. Moving on down, we've got Alex Morono taking on Court McGee. Alex Morono, minus 290. Favorite Court McGee can be had for plus 245. Your thoughts? Yeah, so it sounds like a cop out, I'm sure. But like Morono and Ignacio Bahamandez, those are the guys that I like this week. Like, I'm sure they're on the bigger favorite side, but those are the guys that feel safe. So we've already talked about Ignacio, but in Morono's case, it's like it's no, it's no knock on the old dog Court McGee, but he's very much just a vintage fighter. Like, none of his wins have aged. If you look at all of his wins, these are literally all of them in the UFC, right? Chris McCray retired almost 10 years ago. Ryan Jensen retired 10 years ago. Dongy Yang retired like eight years ago. Josh Neer, my boy. It's all a victory. Again, Josh Neer been retired for four or five years. What over Robert Whitaker? That one actually aged extremely well. Mauricio Alexander, Dominique Steele, Alex Garcia, Claudio Silva, Ramiz Brahamaj. All these guys had really short stints in the UFC. So, so like, again, Court comes from an era of two, early 2010. It was a different time, and he was tough. He was very, very durable. Still to this day, never been submitted. So... Cast iron durability. Can't knock him out. Can't choke him out. You're going to have to fight him for 15 minutes. He's got a checkered pass in the terms of he's overcome a lot of adversity in his personal life. Former drug addict died. And since he came back, he's just like this guy that won't go away. Stays in your face. Puts pressure on you. His, kid bo- his kickboxing is super mid-level. His grappling is not bad. His wrestling is, again, very mid-level. It's his pressure game and his heart and his will to win. And that's what's usually willed him with that durability. And then just the last, I guess he's two and five in his last seven fights. And the wins are both one-dimensional grapplers with bad gas tanks. So Claudio Silva, <laughs> like worst guy on the roster, but also just so one-dimensional with his jiu-jitsu. No wrestling, no striking, no gas tank. Court McGee beats guys like that. Ramiz Brahimaj, yeah, much younger, more athletic, but he's a wrestling, grappling-based guy with no gas tank. So what do you think is going to happen? Tires out, Court McGee takes over. When they give them someone who's not that mold, someone who's just a good striker or they're, they're quicker, they're more athletic, they can stuff his, his takedowns, they're going to really cause him to work. He's at that stage in his career where he just can't keep up. Uh, a lot of these losses early on, like Sean Brady. Sean Brady drops him, but it's a decision loss. Carlos Condit drops him, but it's a decision loss. But then the last two, Jeremiah Wells and, and Matt Brown, both knock him out in the first round, and that's super uncharacteristic for him. So... Again, he's at that stage in his career where he, they're not necessarily beating him. Father Time is beating him. A few years ago, he's way more competitive. At this stage, not so much. His skill set itself, he's very slow. He was never the fastest guy going, but he's a pretty slow going guy. He's not a counter puncher. You know, jabs eat him up all day. He can advance on you. He can push you back to the base of the cage. And something like the Apex probably works better for him. He doesn't have to travel a whole lot of distance. But Morono, not that guy, man. Like, he's got decent footwork. He moves laterally if need be. He's got a lot more volume than than Court McGee. His takedown defense isn't spectacular, but it's good enough to stand up Court McGee. In fact, Morono likely could take down Court if he wanted to. Bottom line, though, is McGee doesn't have enough power to really sting Court McGee. Or, sorry, uh, uh, McGee doesn't have enough power to sting Brandon Morono. And if he doesn't hurt Alex Morono, my bad. If he doesn't hurt Alex Morono, it's just going to be him getting out of volume. He's much slower than him. He doesn't have the output. He doesn't have the pace. He doesn't have the takedown offense to make that a consistent game plan. I, I just don't see it going well for him. Last but not least, his fight with Carlos Condit. You'll remember that one because he's a minus 165 favorite over Carlos Condit, who was on five-fight losing streak. Five-fight losing streak, Carlos Condit's considered all done, all washed up. McGee is a favorite over him. Simply because Carlos Condit can't wrestle. He can't stuff a takedown. And Corey McGee, for whatever reason, is like, I just want to have a fun fight that night. So I decided, I don't want to wrestle. I just want to have a fun fight. That's not smart. It's not how you win fights. And it's not how you would cash a ticket in this circumstance. It's just not the way to do it. But that's what he's been doing. He wants to bang it out with Jeremiah Wells. He wants to bang it out with Matt Brown. Oh, two OGs of the fight game. Let's bang it out. And he gets crumpled over. That durability has gone. The speed was never there. The reflexes are shot. He himself is shot. Can he win the fight? Sure he can. It's a fist fight. He could absolutely win this fight. But the odds and the deck is stacked against him. Now, Morono, you could say, guy's not a superstar. But one, I mean, he's still got a little bit left to, to give. Just went the distance with Joaquin Buckley. That aged pretty well, considering mm. Buckley put an absolute beat down of Vicente Luque that I, I did not see coming. But that one aged well. He actually was pretty competitive with him. Submission win over Tim Means before that. Solid. I think Tim Means beats Court McGee, if we're being honest with you. Solid win. 
The fight with Santiago Ponzinibbio right prior, he gets knocked down in the third. He's winning the fight prior to getting caught by Santiago Ponzinibbio. You know, he's he, he's a guy that's that's not ever going to be a top 10 guy, but is serviceable and can give rounds, can compete for pockets of rounds with a vast majority of the division. So they're doing him a favor by trying to get him back on the win column so that he can be a gatekeeper to the rest of the guys, which is fair. And for court, the writing's on the wall, you know? Ultimate Fighter winner 14 years ago won the Ultimate Fighter. Like, it's... You'd say it's a winnable fight because I don't even know if it is, but at, at, at least it's a 33-year-old that's not some contender series guy that's just going to smash him on live TV and then and then and then make a name off him. Like at least they gave him a guy that's tenured within the division, but it's not a great matchup for him. And again, I fully expect Morono to get the victory. Court McGee's older than me, bro. Washed, washed. And he died. He died of a heroin overdose, and you know, like his body has been through shit. On the Ultimate Fighter, he told a story. I tell this story to people all the time because it like it speaks to addiction. But he's like, they're like, oh yeah, man, you want to drink? You want to drink? And he's like, nah, man, nah, man. And they're just like, nah, man, like not even one. He's like, no, nah, I'm, you know, I'm a recovering addict. And then the he goes, uh, the last time he's like, I had I had one drink, went out, I had one drink. He's like, I woke up three days later in a basement in New Mexico, looking through the carpet for uh, crystal meth rocks. And then, and then the guy he tells this to, I forget who it was, but another tough castmate, he's like, after one drink? And then Cormac, he's like, yeah, after one drink. It's like, that is zero to 100, zero to 100. So that's 14 years ago he's on tough, 20 years ago that he dies. The guy is like absolute badass, has my respect. If the, UFC, if the UFC brought in like OG guys to be in the Hall of Fame, guys like Matt Brown, guys like Cormac McGee, You'd have me with my hand up. I think they're Hall of Fame type guys because they gave everything to the sport. It's just at some point you're not what you used to be. You see it all the time mm -hmm. uh, in boxing, in prize fighting in general, in any sport. You know, it's just the body starts to eventually let up. This is not particularly a pretty matchup for him, so they're not giving him a farewell. But like they say in pro wrestling, it's better to go out on your on your back. And yeah, for him, it was like the the thing with Court McGee is that like the volume was always pretty solid. And the, the, the durability outside of Ponzinibbio knocking him out in 2016, it's just like this guy went to decision with some absolute savages, absolute studs. Like even into like early, you know, early pandemic or like just before the pandemic with like Sean Brady going to decision, Carlos Condit, he lost, but he went to decision there. It's just like he was doing pretty well. Getting knocked out in those last two fights against Matt Brown, another guy who's kind of over the hill. And Jeremiah Wells, who obviously, I mean, you look at the guy, and it's just like, okay, this guy's super, super jacked. If he lands a good one on you, you're going to have a bad time. But, yeah, no, I think Morona kills him. And, uh, yeah, and you know, with the Contender Series and all that coming up on the way, I imagine Court, who's been around for a long time, is like, he's probably getting paid decent for where he fights on the level of the card these days. And the UFC seems to be operating a little bit more as a business and not holding on to guys in the same respect as they used to. Uh, it seems like an easy way to kind of shuffle court out the door, you know, if he's coming off of three straight losses and if they're like brutal knockouts. Um, don't mind Alex Morono knockout one if, uh, if we're being t totally honest. I mean, it opened up at like one book at plus 525, got hit down, to plus 400 immediately. We'll see where the other books open up, but something that I see the trend kind of forming and it's not looking good for Court. Court used to rest on the laurels of that dur durability, and I think it's gone. And yeah, Morono going to decision, being somewhat competitive against uh, Joaquin Buckley, like that, that loss has aged beautifully. Obviously, we're looking at it, you know, with uh, recency bias and all of that, but, you know, we 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 highly rated Vicente Luque going into that matchup. This guy, you know, Alex Morono was able to do much better in that situation than Vicente Luque. So, yeah, I think it's uh, justified chalk on Alex Morono. Needless to say, all right, we got no big Norm Norman Dumont taking on Jermaine Durandamy. I thought Jermaine retired, Cody. I feel like that was something that showed up somewhere along the way. Um, this one was like minus 190. The other, this was like earlier in the show. I said that there were like certain fights that 
I looked at the number. I'm like, well, that's dumb. Um, yeah, it was like minus 190 plus 160. So it's people are kind of reading the tea leaves the same way that I am. One, this fight's at 135 pounds. Big Norm, the lock of the century. Big Norm misses weight minus 1,000. There's no way she's making 135 pounds. She always misses 135. I like I, I agree. Like that's I agree. like this fight may not happen because you have like Jermaine coming off of the shelf, hasn't fought in a long time. You know how it's going to be. They're going to show up at the weigh-ins. Big Norm's going to miss by like three or four pounds, and then when Jermaine, you know, who also has fought at 145, is very very big, taller than um, than Big Norm, when she makes weight, sucks herself dry to get to 135 pounds, and then her opponent misses by like two to three pounds, she's going to be like, this is BS. I'm not taking this fight. Um, so, yeah, this fight's not even going to happen. But for me, it's it's a pretty clear CF dot model type of play. Um, is, is there a possibility that Big Norm's able to take her down, wrestle, uh, control a little bit there? Yeah, but it's like, I think the better athlete, the better, the better, the, the most dominant skill set in this entire fight is gdr's stand-up so yeah i think it's pretty outside of you know retirement and you know what shape is she in coming into this week i think it's gdr all day what about you yeah i'm gonna 100 percent agree it's a total dogger pass situation and jermaine ran to me you could be doing a lot worse it's just that we're taking a, a a throw in the dark here she hasn't fought in nearly three years she recently just gave birth not even like all that long ago, she gave birth, which tough to do when you're nearly 40 years old on its own, but then to jump back in training camp and come off a near three-year-long layoff. Also, she had a legitimate injury during that time because she pulled out of that Irene Aldana fight. How could you love it? How could you love it? But then you see the plus money, you're like, yeah, why the hell not? Now, this is kind of cruel from a UFC matchmaking perspective. You got Big Norm, who's the only 145 pound in the division. It's literally just her. That's it. You've seen her try to make 135, and she uh, she missed it. She missed it. <laughs> These are the two times, right? She misses it against uh, Ashley Evans-Smith. She came in at 139 and a half, mm -hmm. okay? Then she misses it against Aaron Blanchfield coming in at a 139 and a half. Blanchfield declined the fight, so it never happened, but she made weight, or she didn't make weight. She got on the scale, and it got canceled right after that. The fight with Macy Chase on, which is her only loss in the UFC, she loses a split decision. Sorry, other than the debut against Megan Anderson. <laughs> she missed weight at 145 pounds. The fight was at 145, and she came in at 146 and a half. So to think, to think that she's going to be suddenly making 135 two years later, she's nearly 34 years old. Not going to happen. Paul, I completely agree. And then for Jermaine, she's a former 145 pound champ. And. She hasn't had to make 135 since her last fight, I suppose, but that was nearly three years ago. She's almost 40, and she just had a baby. So it way, makes way more sense for both of them to just fight at 145 or to catch weight of 140. Why not? But no, no, it's like that division doesn't exist, so there's no more catering to you. Norm is, doesn't have any other opponents unless she cuts down to 135, so very much she needs to do it. And then for... Jermaine Duran me, yeah, I mean, literally, she made it against Juliana Payne her last time out. She's a consummate pro. I don't think she'll have trouble making it. So 135 probably works better for her. Why give Big Norm the extra 10 pounds? But for Big Norm, it's going to be one hell of a weight cut. So right off the get-go, you know that Norm's going to have a big weight cut. Makes it makes it enticing for the underdog. Beyond that, it's that Big, big Norm's not a huge takedown threat. She'll get a takedown or two in a lot of these fights. And I think she shows like a 64% takedown accuracy. But she's not this girl that's going to just stick to that game plan and just peel you down time and time again and establish top control. She largely just holds you up in the clinch up against the fence. Now, it's super low volume, right? When you look at the vast majority of these fights, uh, she lands 47 against Chelsea Chandler over 15 minutes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight fights in the UFC, right? And outside of the de her debut where she got starched by Megan Anderson, a legitimate 45-er, she seven straight decisions. So she's a decision fighter. 47 over 15. Against Carl Rosa, she landed 35 over 15. Against Danielle Wolf. Danielle Wolf was 1 0, nearly 40 years old, and a pro boxer. And she puts up like a career best, not a career best, but 52 would be considered high by her standard. That's what she landed. Her loss to Missy Chase on, she landed 38. Against Aspen Ladd, that would have been her, you know, her at her best. 65 and 68, respectively, against 
uh, Spencer, Aspen Lad, Ashley Evans Smith. That would have been, I guess. How long is that? That's four years ago. Almost. Almost four years. What I'm getting at is it's largely just clinch control. There's not a whole lot of volume. Seven straight decisions. The power's not there. She's a BJJ black belt. The submissions aren't there. If you're not submitting Danielle Wolf, you ain't submitting nobody. So it's largely just cling on to your opponent and stall out and kill time, which clearly is effective. She's on a three-fight winning streak. She's six and one in her last seven fights. Pretty, pretty impressive. But again, it's subjective. So any underdog that's willing to go out there and work is going to have success because they're in the apex and we see it time and time again. Control time isn't necessarily scoring as much as damage. When you want to talk about damage, Jermaine Durandamy is all about it. She's very solid in the clinch. The Iron Lady works the body with knees, super effective. She's got elbows from her Muay Thai background. At range, she's going to be landing the heavier shots. And, and the one issue, the two issues that have always, to me, made Jermaine Durandamy not the most elite of the elite, she's probably top, still top three in the world. The one, two things that were kind of holding her back, she got elite striking. Her cardio not that good, and her ground game's not that good. The last two fights that she's had, Paul, she went five rounds with Amanda Nunez, where Amanda Nunez had to resort to taking her down eight times because she wanted nothing to do with the striking with JDR. Mm -hmm. She went five rounds and didn't gas. The cardio, it was fixed. The subsequent fight against Juliana Pena, cardio, still looked rock solid, and then she choked her out. And how good did that one age? Pena goes on to win a title. Pena is probably the number two ranked girl in the division, with Jermaine Durandamy as the number three ranked girl in the division. So I'm getting a top three girl coming off a career best performance. Looked really good her last two as far as I'm concerned. It's not over the hill. She hasn't taken any damage over that time span. All this goodness versus a hold on to you and cling on to you type game plan from Big Norm. And it's plus money for Jermaine yeah. Durand. I mean, like, yeah, again, these are these are the type of dog spots that like, you, could you lose? Sure, you could lose. But are you at least in a spot to win more often than not? Or at the very least, if you were to win 50% of the time on a plus money play like that, you're going to come out on the positives. That's the kind of play it is. It's a dogger pass. It's it's an absolute quintessential dogger pass. So I would definitely take the former champion who's got the back class. And yeah, there's a layoff. We've seen good fighters come back from long layoffs and still look good. It's a quality of who you are. And she's a former champion. People will say she's the worst champion in UFC history. Fair. It's only because the division's not a big division. She fought all the best girls. She fought anybody that was put in front of her. She was kickboxing the best girls. She's fighting in, you know, promotions before the UFC against the best available talent outside the UFC. She's got my respect. And uh, for the plus money, sign me up. Yeah, my concern originally was like, am I missing something here? When I saw the plus 170, like literally two days ago. And then I wish I had snapped on it. Because literally the market, like everyone else basically started looking at these fights with a fine tooth comb and obviously the market is starting to crash in that direction. Cause it's like, this doesn't make any sort of sense, but I would say the more likely thing that ends up happening. Here's a fight. Doesn't even happen at all. Cause big norm's going to miss weight. And Jermaine's going to be like, I just had a kid. I, I don't want to, I don't want to be given anybody, any sort of concessions here. I'm bigger than this girl. Like why? Can't she make the weight? Their UFC is not going to give her extra money. People miss that. Oh, like Cody was doing you, the money you, sign. They're, for yeah, this because, fight, because, like, yeah. they're, they're just going to let this fight not happen. No, man. She has, Jermaine hasn't fought in three years. So, one, she wants to compete. Two, yeah. she just has a baby, and she's like, I, I pff, get me out of the house. I need to fight somebody. I like it. The other thing is, is that she would have gotten a real nice little payday when she challenged for the title against Amanda Nunez. But almost five years ago, four and a half years ago, her disclosed pay for that fight was $100,000. She was on a 100 and a 100 for her fight with Amanda Nunez. And she lost. So she collected $100,000, which after taxes in the United States, paying your camp, paying your nutritionist, paying just everything that goes into having a world-class camp for a world-class fight, not a whole lot of money. But that would have been considered a career-high payday. Fight with Juliana Pena, she also made a 100 and 100, and she won. And she got a submission of the night bonus. So she made $250,000 for that fight. Dope. That's where you want to be. And then presumably her next fight with Irene Aldana would have been a 125 and 125, a winnable fight against Aldana. And the winner of that fight got the title fight, but she got hurt. She didn't have the Aldana fight. And now it's been three years. And now that 250 payday that you got was three and a half years ago. Mine. So do you think of her, do you think of her opponent? Yeah. And she's a former world champ at 145. So do you think if the UFC was like, 
Big Norm's at 139 and a half, which seems to be Big Norm's number when she tries band and weight, 139 and a half. If they were to be like, she's 139 and a half, we'll give you 20% of her, her purse and you can fight her. You think she's going to turn it down? No chance. No chance. But uh, we'll see. I would say let's take a shoey bet on this fight happening or not, but uh, it's big norm. <laughs> no, we're not. And she might, she might, she might miss weight and then pull out herself, being like, I'm "I mean, if you gave me, if you gave me ten to one, if you gave me ten to one, I'd do no, it. no, but <laughs> we could just, we could just, we could just pass. It's a possibility. I just, uh, I don't think it'll be on JDR's. Uh, it won't be on her side. I think she's willing to come in here and do what she's got to do to get. Not necessarily she's broke, she needs paid, but just like she's chomping at the bit to get back to regular competition, and payday certainly wouldn't hurt. My Time really flies. Eh? I have kind of forgot that Jermaine was gone for that long. I'm looking through her Instagram right now. I will say it's a sign, Cody. Her dog looks exactly like my dog, Gabby. Well, oh, her, hers, nice looks, hers looks a little bit more pity, like with a bit of a fatter face than, than my pup, but... But yeah, it's like when they were announcing that they were pregnant, her and her partner. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, well, let's not even get into that. I was reading through the comments and people were like, well, actually, you can't get pregnant. And it's just like, OK, bro. OK, we we, we all get that. <laughs> OK, done. yeah, we, sure. we get that. Sure. Be, ha be happy for them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which I am. <laughs> <So> I, <laughs> which think, I, think, I think. Um, my boy Clint, he, he, my, he's a good guy, but he was like, you know, I think it takes a while to recover from something like that. And I was like, you know what? Paul and I have had this discussion many, many She's times. She's like a cop too, right? Like Ma this is not it's your mama bear syndrome. Mm -hmm. Once you have that kid, it's mama bear syndrome. And now it's just like, hey, I got to defend my cub. And if you're going to give me plus money on Jermaine Durand me defending her cub versus big norm. I take it. I take GDR it. and GDR was a cop. Like this is not your just like run of the mill lady. You know, like this is a hard iron, nose. This iron is a lady. Hot, her name is the Iron Lady for a good reason. If anybody can come back from you know a three year layoff, having a kid, all of that, it's the uh, it's the Iron Lady at thirty nine years old. So dog money, sign us up. All right, we got Piero Rodriguez taking on Cynthia Calvillo. Pierre Rodriguez is a minus 130 favorite. Calvillo can be had for plus 110. Who you got? I'll try to get rifling through some of these ones for you. But yep. uh, yeah, honestly, it's more dog money on Cynthia Calvillo. It's another dog or pass situation in a women's MMA fight. The knock on Calvillo, people are saying, you know, 36 years old, five fight losing streak, hasn't looked good in a while. That's where I will disagree. She is 36 years old. Can't disagree with that. She is on a five fight losing streak. Cannot disagree with that. Her not looking good, I don't necessarily think that's the case. All she does is fight former world title challengers or top three girls, top five girls. She only fights the creme de la creme and she never really looks all that out of place outside of the Andrea Lee fight where she quit between rounds outside of that though. Uh, the Caitlin Chikagian fight, you know, solid fight. She doesn't get outstruck by that much. She got the lone takedown Her fight with Jessica Andrade, former world champion, her fight with Nina Nunez split decision loss. She outstruck Nina Nunez 48 to 39 and she got the three takedowns in that fight. Close fight, competitive fight loses a split. And you know as well as I do, Nina Nunez is pretty good. So I give her a pass on that one. The very next one with Lupita Godinez. She outstrikes Lupita Godinez 104 to 87 and gets the fight's lone takedown. Stuff both of the, the shots from Lupita Godinez, who's known as one of the better-ish, not as good as Verna Jandaroba apparently, but one of the better-ish wrestler grapplers of the division. So again, she outstrikes her. She takes her down. You know she's got that wrestling base. Spent a lot of time with Team Alpha Male. She's a pretty decent boxer within the division standards. Has a nasty jab on her. Has output. And she's largely been struggling with weight cuts and fighting at 125. Her last time out against Lupita Godinez, it's her first time at 115. And she makes the weight comfortably. And she looks really good. Her cardio checked out. She's ultra competitive. She drops a split to one of the ranked girls of the, of the division and landed over 100 significant strikes in a takedown. There's, there's worse performances than that. Piera Rodriguez has not fought anything to that level. Like, she herself is not a young prospect. She's 31 years old. But if you look at her fight with pretty much all of them, her she wins the LFA title. She beats um, Valeska Machado on the Contender Series by decision. Her fight with Kay Hansen, pretty competitive. She wins by decision. Her fight with Sam Hughes, she tires. The longer the fight goes, she muscles a lot of her technique. She's pretty built physically strong. She muscles her wrestling. I don't think she's got a world-class ground game. She's most definitely not a world-class striker. Her cardio is really not all that good. She's only got 10 pro fights since she's 31 years old, so there's not really a, a deep experience there. I think she's very 
very much a mid-level fighter. And then and then they give her Jillian Robertson, who's decent, is good. You know, Jillian Robertson's good. Jillian Robertson, outside of that first round, what happens? Rodriguez gasses. Rodriguez gives up the takedowns. And Robertson just has her way with her. The same way that Jillian Robertson has her way with Pollyanna Viana or Maria Agapova or girls that can't grapple, right? So I am just so not sold on Piera Rodriguez. When I look at Cynthia Calvillo, I think, okay, five fight losing streak aside, every single one of those girls on that loss were better than her opponent that she's currently facing. Second time at 115, she'd be better for her. She's accustomed to the weight cut. She had a good enough performance first time around. Sophomore outing, she'd be better. She's got superior volume. She just landed a 100 significant strike performance. She's got a way better jab. She's technically the better boxer. She's actually a better wrestler. She could take down Rodriguez and, and, and cause her all types of problems, or at the very least, just sprawl the shot, move to the outside, and keep going to work. She's had issues within her career. I get that. She's 36. I get that. There's a five-fight losing streak. I get that. You want to see a five-fight losing streak? Let Piera Rodriguez fight the five girls that she just fought, you know? Mm. Four of which were up at 125. So it sounds like I'm getting heated because I'm passionate because I'm certain. I'm not certain, dude. This is women's MMA fight, and I got a 36-year-old on a five-fight losing streak. I'm not certain at all. It's just, again, total dog or pass situation, and very much I'm on Team Calvillo this weekend to right the ship and get the job done. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully Calvillo like channels her inner, you know, waitress at the uh, Cheesecake Factory and like pretends that Piera Rodriguez gave her like a bad tip or like a bad review. No so tip. Asked to speak to her manager or something. No, I, I totally agree. So she went through. There were such high hopes for her that she ended up in situations against divisions elite up at 125 pounds and on top of that it's like that division was kind of just starting to shake itself out so she was one of the faces that ended up against the the Chicagians and and um and the Jess Condrads and so forth um but yeah that that fight against Loopy I mean I bet her against Loopy and she was like a plus 300 underdog um I thought she actually should have pulled out that that decision i thought the move down to this division made a lot of sense for her yeah i think as a dog shot i think you could do a lot worse than cynthia calvillo she will be my pick as well we got john masumoto taking on dan argetta matsumoto a minus 160 favorite argetta can be had for plus 140 who you got yeah, so Dan Argueta would be a live underdog, and I think he's got keys to go out there and win this fight, but he's very inconsistent, and that's what I have trouble betting him as an underdog. If he's on, he's a power wrestler, power grappler, establishes top control, you know, decent enough pace, and his cardio checks out. When he's not on, he's one-dimensional with his approach that he needs the takedown. His striking is predicated on just, like, two big shots from the outside, explosiveness, and that explosiveness drains him out and tires him out. So, again, him at his best would be... Yeah, him versus Ronnie Lawrence, you know, him and his worst is him versus Miles John, I guess, right? It's like the tale of two fighters. So going back right from his debut. So prior to that, he won the LFA title. He fought five rounds in that fight. So a guy that presumably could fight five rounds. He's got five round cardio. He's a former champ. He's done it before. He, he gritted deep and got the decision victory. And then four weeks later made his UFC debut up a weight class against Damon Jackson. Loses the first two rounds and then gives Damon Jackson hell in that third round and almost puts him away. Solid performance. Loses, but solid performance. Up a weight class, short notice. Guy can fight rounds. He's got cardio. The Ronnie Lawrence fight. Trucks Ronnie Lawrence. No contest, sure, but it was heading in his direction. There was no tap. I get it. There was still lots of rounds to be fought out, but you know, it was a solid performance from him. And then the last one against Miles John. I know Miles John is coming off a couple wins. I know Miles John tested positive for steroids for that fight, so... You could easily give him a pass, but he just flat gassed, man. He had an okay first round. He just flat gassed. So if I can't trust him to chain wrestle and power grapple for 15 full minutes, then what's the matter? He gets a good round in, and then he falls apart in the second or the third. It's just not good enough. Jean Matsumoto, meanwhile, he's only 24. So he's still young. He's undefeated. He's green. He's green in his own ways. Someone is going to not expose him, but someone will teach him a lesson eventually. Someone with that style. Someone with a style like Argueta. That can do it for 15 minutes. But outside of that, John Masamoto looks legit, man. His striking is slick, high level. He's got a BJJ black belt. Very opportunistic with a submission game off of his back. Could I see Argueta wrestling him and establishing top control? Yes. Yeah, I can. 
if Argueta doesn't get that submission, he's still going to be dealing with a very active and wily opponent off his back. And once Matsumoto inevitably gets back up, he's going to just be out striking him and hurting him. So Argueta with a full tank of gas is a problematic opponent style-wise. But if he comes out that same version that he did against Miles John, he just gasses out after a round. It's not going to go good for him. So I think I'm going to go Matsumoto. Going to go Matsumoto. But yeah, even just minus 185... Young kid, undefeated record, UFC debut, looks super skilled, but I, we don't know that he's got the dog in him yet. Whereas Argueta probably doesn't. But you've seen moments of his career where it's like, yeah, there's so there's some, there's some, you know, ability to grind on through to the other side and keep it competitive and keep it close and keep it, you know, a greasy affair, get it to decision, win the decision. He can do it. I'm just not fully convinced that at 30 years old, he's getting any better. His last performance was a bit of a dud. And he's a 50-50 guy to me. So Matsumoto looks like one of these kids that's going to be a contender in a few years. Maybe jump on him right away. So uh, Jean Matsumoto will be the pick. I can't really agree. I can't disagree with too much. But like the problem is, yeah, we don't really have like the full understanding of what John Matsumoto is up to. I, I mean, Dan Argella, the way that he's going to win this fight is grappling, grappling early, grappling often. Like His body frame just dictates that that's what he's got to do. And, uh, I mean, the the Ronnie Lawrence fight particularly, like, he went out there and just absolutely big-brothered him um, early in that fight. This guy, there's no denying that this guy, particularly early in fights, is super, super dangerous because he's just so, so strong for this division. But what does it look like as you get a little bit deeper into fights? We don't entirely know. 14-0 and 0 for the Brazilian um, contender series fight, being able to put up some, uh, some half decent volume in that spot. Um, yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. hundred significant strikes. He gave up two takedowns. So yeah, it's a little bit dicey. We'll see. Like I, I, I no doubt in my mind that like Argetta's going to be able to get takedowns particularly early, but if this guy can just if this Matsumoto can just stay out of trouble and so you see some other like submission wins on his career, uh, on his record, super, super young, obviously working on it. Just stay out of trouble early. It's just like, you should take over late. So I'm with you. I'm going to, I'm going to side with the, uh, the contender series graduate in John Matsumoto as well. we got Dylan Budka taking on Cesar Almeida minus 150 for Budka plus 130 for Almeida. I know he's old Cody. But give me the guy with the win over Alex Pereira at dog at dog money. Come on, his fight on contender. He was a big underdog on like contender series as well. Why? Why does? Why does the market? Why does everyone hate this guy so much? What does Cesar Almeida have to do to get some respect around here? What are your thoughts on this fight? Yeah, that's fair. He's got a win over Alex Pereira in a kickboxing match. For the record, he's one and two versus Alex Pereira, but does have the one win, and it's from 2013. So it's 11 years ago. Long time has passed. Since then, he's been mostly kickboxing, and he didn't go on to be a world champion. He didn't go on to be a local champion. He just kept kickboxing. Pereira was a world champion. Israel Adesanya was a world champion. Those guys got to the highest level of kickboxing and then transitioned over. He didn't. He kickboxed for way too long for small purses, and then eventually at the age of 35 decides, I'm going to try this MMA thing because I got a win over Alex Pereira, and he's in the UFC. He's a champion. So the UFC will say, great, throw him on the Contender Series right away. Big underdog on the Contender Series because people are not sold on. Even though he's got the kickboxing, even though he's got the win, not all that good. That's an interesting fight he has in the contending series, right? Because he gives up three takedowns on 10 attempts, right? And of those three takedowns that he gave up, he gave up five minutes and 44 seconds of control time. But one of them, he hit a reversal, and that led to him getting about five minutes of control time. Had he not hit a sweep over a guy that's otherwise not very good, he probably gives up 10 minutes of control time. So even though he's probably got what would be considered good kickboxing by the UFC standard and by the division standard, He's got good kickboxing. His cardio, it doesn't look bad. Hey, he landed 71 significant strikes in that fight despite giving up five minutes of control time off of his back. So volume's not bad. Cardio's not bad. You know he's a good kickboxer. At plus money, there's a lot to like. That's fair. It's just the choice of opponent that I find strange. Like Dylan Budka is not someone you would give 
He's not very good, but he's not somebody that you would give to a, a kickboxer, a 36-year-old UFC debuting kickboxer. Like, why would you not give him someone that can strike? You'll see they tried to match him up with Christian Leroy Duncan, which would have been dope because they're both strikers, right? Guy's got to win over Pereira. The other guy's, you know, karate black belt and a long-rangey athletic kickboxer. That's a fun fight. You know, match him up with guys like Armin Petrosian. It's a fun fight. Match him up with guys that are going to bang it out. Those are all great fights. And then from there, they try to book him with Josh Frem. Frem gets hurt, and Dylan Budka's in the fight. Now, Budka's very just one-dimensional with his wrestling. He's out of Ohio. He's out of a wrestling-heavy gym. He himself wrestled at uh, not the University of Notre Dame, but Notre Dame College in Ohio. So he's got wrestling, collegiate wrestling pedigree. And then on the UFC, he himself was an underdog against that Chad Hanacom, who's supposed to just blow his head off. You know, his strike is not very good. His output's not very good. But he can wrestle. And when sucks. matched with... It was awful, dude. It was a terrible fight. But when matched up with a guy that could not wrestle, all he did was just cling on to him. I'm shocked that Dana gave him a contract, but Dana was just like, sure, I'm signing everybody this, this season. Here you go. The thing is that he's only 24 years old. He's not old. He's just, he only knows one thing right now, which is wrestling. Jiu-Jitsu will come. Striking will come. Smart, you know, decisions in the octagon, all that stuff will come. But for right now, he's just very green one-dimensional with his wrestling. He loses to 98% of the division. The thing is, is that there's like 2 or 3% of that division that are guys that are 36 years old and only have four pro MMA fights and uh, gave up three takedowns and almost six minutes of control time in their last fight and uh, are primarily just kickboxers. So Budka can win still, even though he's not all that good. He's, he's just green and can wrestle. He can still win when matched up with a guy that's fairly green and can only green in the grappling department. It can only strike. It's striker versus grappler. So in the apex, the guy that's trying to fight and land the damage should win. But Budka just won in a terrible fight against Hanacom in the apex. So he's comfortable here. He knows what he's got to do, which is just land takedowns. The fact that he's on short notice, I'm a little bit concerned because he's going to need to be able to do it for 15 full minutes. And I'm not 100% convinced that he's going to be able to do so. And this is largely just a pass fight altogether. But like, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I love the underdog selection. So for the show, I'll take Budka. Uh, yeah, let's shoo I, it. I, I, we'll we'll shoo it. Let's, I don't know. I don't want to shoo. Let's shoo it at this no one. Way. I mean, I'm no giving way. you, I'm giving you the minus one. No way. One, minus one fifty. Not good. I'm giving Doesn't, you the minus one fifty. I'm giving you. I'm giving you positive VV here. Uh, I would have to have something. We need like, a shoey for like when we do our show at the uh, at the circa uh, pool next week. Well, like, we could do a shoey down there. That's not a problem. This boot, this boot has to make an appearance. Yeah, you'll be arrested at customs, and I'll pick <laughs> yeah, up your probably. luggage. I'll pick up your luggage from uh, the airport when we arrive. Potentially. Um, yeah, I, do I, it. I, I don't. I don't know. Do man. it. I wouldn't, even do though it. I'm the kind of guy that just loves the competitiveness of a bet and it's like, let's do it. I'm fully admitting that Budka's probably, in fact, I can almost certainly guarantee you that he is the PRP pick. I don't like it. I could see Wayne's and change my mind. There's no conviction from it whatsoever. But again, you're looking at one guy that can only wrestle versus one guy that can only strike. I think Budka just puts hands on him, ties him up. Tosses him to the ground, gets some control time, survives the third round up to wins. Is it worth taking a shoey bet over? Nah, man. I'm not in. I'm not in on that. I'll tell you what, you can take a shoey bet on Nora Cornoli for three no, to one. No, this you is want. why this is why, why I Why, why? You love Nora no, Cornoli. Man. This is why we well, you're one and oh one. This Nora is why Cornoli. I offered the shoey bet because we hadn't made one over the course of the show. And I was just like, this seems like our last opportunity. You love your girl, Melissa. Uh, no mess. Just force in it, you know. Just a force. Minus three fifty. It's like who are the who are the who are the dogs on this card that people might disagree with you on? It's like, well, I like Chris Curtis, but you like Chris Curtis. It's like, well, I like Chepe. I'll take one on him. It's like, oh, well, well, you like Chepe? Okay. Uh, I like Trevor Peak. Why is Cesar made Trevor a, a force? He's four and zero as a pro. He's taking on a guy who you even say is like very one dimensional. Only can do four, one four, thing. Four, one on contender series with two takedowns and twenty two significant strikes. Like it's not like he did anything significant in that fight. I remember watching Caesar Almeida on the contender series. He got taken down, but he got he got back to his feet pretty quick and his striking pedigree just kind of makes him better than a lot of these low level scrubs. Hence why I'm offering I am put I am reaching out, trying to make a shoey bet with you. 
and you won't take it. So that's that's all I'm saying. Uh, if you gave me two to one, I'll why, take it for two why to do, one. I'll take it for two to one. I'm taking the underdog. Why would I give you two to the, one? This line, this line. If this line oh, flipped, okay. I don't think anybody would be like, no. "I wonder why." I it's feel like, like the it's line a greasy will flip. fifty fifty. It, it might because it's a greasy fifty fifty ass fight, man. It doesn't. There's no angle here. And for the record, he's four and zero. His wins are Tiago Arroyo, zero and zero back in twenty sixteen. That guy never fought again. Strong possibility never existed at all. Then he beat uh, Vitor Costa, who was zero and zero. That fight was five years later in twenty twenty one. That guy's apparently all right. Daniel Souza is five and twenty eight, and then he fought in the Contender Series. So yeah, yeah, I'm talking myself into taking the shoey bet, but ultimately that would just mean I'm too emotional, and it's not good bankroll management. It'd be like making a. <laughs> there bad is no bet. bankroll. It's a shoey. It, no, it's the same. It's the same mindset. You have to have the mindset of being responsible in spots. This is highly irresponsible for me to take the shoey bet. I'll do a shoey down in Vegas. We're down in Vegas. We're having a good time. You know, I'm apparently partying on the strip three days by myself. You guys are all working. All news to me. Well, you can come work as well. But... So there'll be there'll be time for bad bets and bad shoey opportunities. But right now, while well, I've only had two beers, Paul, and I don't love this whatsoever, I'm still clear headed enough to know you set me up. So uh, I was I was I'm trying out. to set you up. I'm I, out. Dylan Buck has got like that little like man bun on the top of his head. It's just like I'm typically like historically out on anybody with like that man bun look i don't know what it is but give me the guy who has a win over alex Pereira against any man on earth with a man bun what about yuri yuri petroska's got a man bun that's like one of that's like that's the rarefied air that's that's one of the few people with a man bun that i would not take but well, otherwise, like, think that. of other people with man buns. Yeah, yeah, How many yeah. man Ta buns would you take in a fight? Yeah. Not many. Not many. To be honest with you, and I, and I will give you a pass, Yuri does not have a man bun. It's not a man bun. It's a samurai bun. It's true. It's a very yeah, big difference. Big it's a difference. very big difference. And then 100%. Charles Johnson, his is, it does not sit at the top of his head. It very strangely enough sits right at the back of his head. So it's more in rat tail mullet type territory if mm -hmm. anything so yeah you're not wrong I, I i hear what you're saying i i see what you're putting down and if you see the prp get tweeted out front or on saturday and there was a switch i'm gonna take credit i'm gonna take credit i'm gonna be like i can't i can't, I'm, I can't get invested on boot i got much, in either. i got into his head thank god he's go. respecting the the good name of cesar almeida all right and finally we got uh no mess mullins taking on nora cornhole uh mullins a minus 350 favorite cornhole can be half a plus 280 i don't like cornhole whatsoever but cody in the lead up to this fight obviously watching the, the what the daria fight with cornhole and like going back watching that in advance is like not that cornhole is like some sort of like murderous power puncher or cause any sort of problems but like it's or uh, it's kind of a bit of a struggle Watching Cornhole, seeing a minus 350 price tag against uh, in this matchup and being confident enough to pull it. When we see what Daria, when she shows up to the UFC, is able to do. And that was Rob Monster at Rendon, frankly. Um, maybe not Rob, but the fight was so close. And I mean, if we're talking damage, uh, Daria's face was a lot more messed up. Than, than Rendon's in that fight. And a lot of people thought that like the only way that Rendon could win that fight was through wrestling. But it's like, I don't know, man. It's, it's not that I don't think Melissa Mullins wins this fight. It's that I hate minus 350. Like, there's no way I could ever get to that number. Coronel, not, I'm not a big fan of hers whatsoever. I think that in her UFC fight... I mean, that was over in France. She takes on Jocelyn Edwards. I thought she lost that fight against Jocelyn Edwards. But, I mean, if you put a gun to my head, if I had to bet one side, I'm. it's going to be a pass for me, 100%. But I would just enact the CF dot model at this number and take Cornhole plus 280. I'm not great about it. I understand how... Mullins' strategy, her game plan, her like top pressure, takedowns, 
and uh, your ground and pound is probably favorable in a setting like the the UFC Apex, but I can't get to it at minus 350. So I guess it's uh, Cornhole or Pass, the great Cornhole. Yeah, that's though. that's that's fair enough. You got Melissa Dixon now and Melissa No Mess Mullins. Uh, yeah, she's undefeated as Melissa Dixon as a pro. Melissa Mullins, we don't know. But yeah, again, all jokes aside... I think she wins the price you don't love. I would suggest that probably the best way of uh, approaching this one is the live betting market. You're not going to get much of a worse price than Mullins for the conceivable future, even two, three minutes into the round. Even if she wins the first round, it's not going to change a whole lot off that minus 350. It's entirely possible that she loses the first round. She seems to be a very slow starter. She's a little bit stiff and rigid there in the early going, but she's a tank engine, man. She just keeps continuously building up momentum, getting better and better. If you look back at that Daria fight, you're absolutely right. She's getting lit up, but here's a girl that's never been stopped before. She fought, I think, in three IMAF tournaments as an amateur, fought all of the best girls at her weight class as an amateur, and has never been finished. So she's got good durability. The thing is, is that Daria is most definitely landing, and it's effective, and it's seemingly stunning her, but like, the longer the fight goes... Mullins just keeps coming forward. Mullins ties her out, gets her to the ground, and then from there, it's just easy control. She's got a really good way of passing over to Mount. She's got heavy hips, excellent top control. Daria gasses. Mullins takes over. Quality victory. Signs to the UFC. Slight favorite status over Irina Alexeva. Alexeva's got a win in the UFC over Stephanie Egger at that point. Is thought to be like the Russian Ronda, and you know, has got good judo and good striking. Mullins again gets dropped in the first round. It's not a good first round. She's a little bit st stiff. She's a little bit slow. She gets hurt. It's the longer the fight goes, it's the exact same thing, Paul. Now, she fought a long time as an amateur, and even now she's 32 years old. So she's not a young prospect. She's more of a refined version of herself. But she's one of these slow starters, keeps coming in rounds two and three. Flip side to Cornell, she is 34 years old. She only got signed to the UFC because they were in Paris, France. They needed local French fighters, and she fit the bill. She fought uh, Jocelyn Edwards. She got taken down five times. It probably robbed her, man. I, I thought Edwards won. Most people thought Edwards won. The problem is Edwards didn't land any strikes. And so Cornoli, who landed 40, outstruck Edwards like 40 to 14. Yeah, she gave up five takedowns, but the strikes seemed to be the difference maker in that one. That's in front of a live crowd, in front of your own people, and the judges, and all that. The 40 significant strikes was able to get it by in a fight you were otherwise getting controlled and dominated in. Well, that's not going to be on the table against Mullins, right? Your hometown crowd's not there. The suspect judging, it'll be there because it's Las Vegas. But beyond that, it's like you're not going to be able to get away with a lower volume uh, affair. And I think Mullins is going to be continuously coming forward and being the aggressor and landing more damage. And she may have a bad first round. She may get hurt in the first round. You may get a much better price after the first round. But rounds two and three is where she's going to take over. And the fact that Jocelyn Edwards got five or six takedowns, and that much control time, I think that Melissa Mullins can do it. If she chooses not to grapple, which she might not, I think just, again, being that forward movement and, and being the one that's looking to mix it up, landing the combinations, out-volume your opponent. Cornoli at 34 is not some world beater. She's, you know, very much just... I wouldn't even know what to classify her as. If she wins this one, that's solid for her. Two-fight winning streak, it's a thin division, move your way up. I just don't think she quite get there. Minus 350, minus 325, Hard money line to get to for Melissa Mullins. Melissa Mullins by decision, perhaps, to help improve it. Maybe some over-unders on some rounds. I, I had a look at that. It didn't look great, to be honest with you. But those are probably the ways of attacking it. I'm going to play her this week. Yeah, yeah. There's other favorites that I don't like as much as her. But again, you're getting into a territory here where you're betting three and a half to one on WMMA. And, you know, we know how that goes for the most part. So live underdogs on that side. CF Dot Model came through hard with Mino Fioro last week and otherwise abysmal outing for myself. At least she came through, came through by decision. And on this card, what do we got? We got three women's MMA fights. Mm -hmm. Got two underdogs already, but I'm not looking for that dog sweep here. I think the rightful favorite Mullins does win and uh, puts an end to that. But if I want to improve it, I think I'll go with that decision. All right. We are just about out of time, but before we go, Cody, hit him with the PRP. PRP, we are going with Chris Curtis, dog number one, Alexander Hernandez, Chepe Mariscal, dog number two, Ignacio Bahamandez, Walter Walker, Trevor Peak, dog number three, Alex Morono, Jermaine Durandamy, dog number four, Cynthia Calvillo, dog number five, Jean Masumoto, Dylan Budka, oh, it still hurts me to say it, and then Melissa Tanya Mullins. So, yeah, I mean, four underdogs, again, what I might, wouldn't mind squeezing one extra, but I don't want to force it. The other underdogs I don't mind would be your guy, Cesar Almeida, if he shows up and he cold cocks him. Argueta, if you knew he was going to be in good shape, 
totally live. Uh, Lucas Brzezinski, Walter Walker could be a fraud. Like, just buyer beware there. And then, yeah, outside of that, I don't love a whole lot of the other underdogs. I guess Damon Jackson, if Hernandez frauds himself again. But mm -hmm. there'll be dogs hitting. Hopefully, we're on the right track of or the, the, the right side of the track. I hope that you switch over to Cesar Almeida. What does that guy have to do to get some respect? Anyway, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For producer Megan and Cody Sapzik, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Oh, oh, oh.